Hey everyone, this is episode two of the Tricky Parts of Calculus. This is the series where I talk about the subtle, difficult, confusing parts of calculus that no one ever covers in a calculus class. Uh, I'm thinking it's probably most appropriate for people who have already learned calculus, but uh, could someone who's uh, just learning it for the first time get something out of this? Not impossible. So let's get to it. The point of this episode is to supply all the geometry and analysis we need to prove that the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. First, I'll quickly recall the argument from last time and the key inequalities that the proof depended on. Then I'll show how Archimedes proved these inequalities over 2200 years ago by introducing two new axioms about lengths of curves. And then I'll take a more modern viewpoint and prove Archimedes' axioms. This will give a satisfying resolution to finding the derivatives of trig functions starting from their most natural definition. In the last episode, I introduced the most natural definition of the trigonometric function sine and cosine in terms of lengths of arcs on the unit circle, a definition which best connects their geometric significance to their ability to capture periodic phenomena. Here's a sketch of the graphs of sine and cosine. The unit circle definition makes most of the important properties of this function obvious, like the relationship sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1, or that they're periodic of period 2 pi, or that sine is odd and cosine is even. The difficulty comes in trying to show that these functions are differentiable and, for example, the derivative of sine x is cosine x. Last time, I reduced the problem of computing the derivative of the sine function to the computation of the limit sine x over x as x goes to zero. So just as an aside, I know that many calculus students, who to be fair get a lot thrown at them in a calculus class, find it convenient to remember the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero by using L'Hopital's rule and remembering that the derivative of sine is cosine. But this obviously doesn't help compute this limit the first time because we have to compute this limit in order to compute the derivative of sine in the first place. So making sure that we can provide complete proofs that are not circular is a major goal of this series. So computing the key limit sine x over x involved bounding the length of an arc between the lengths of two straight segments to obtain the inequalities sine x is less than x, which is less than tangent of x, for x greater than zero in the first quadrant. With these inequalities, you can show that cosine x is less than sine x over x is less than 1, and then the squeeze theorem gives that the limit of sine x over x as x goes to 0 is 1. These inequalities, though, are the key points, and they require a proof, one that doesn't depend on the derivatives of sine or tangent, since that's what we're after in the first place. And, like I mentioned before, you can't avoid this problem by comparing areas of triangles in the sector as sine x over 2 is less than x over 2 is less than tan x over 2, because that proof requires knowing the area of a sector bounded by the arc of length x, which you can calculate if you know how the area of a circle relates to its circumference, but that's precisely the problem that Archimedes was trying to solve that required the proof of the length comparisons we're interested in in the first place. So part two. To emphasize the point, Archimedes was not trying to compute the limit sine x over x as x goes to zero, but he was trying to convince himself and others that the circumference of a circle makes sense as a length, like the length of a straight line, and is a constant multiple of the radius, and is related to the area by the formula area equals one half CR. So it's the same as a right triangle with side lengths R and C. And that the circumference is larger than the perimeter of any inscribed polygon and smaller than the perimeter of any circumscribed polygon. How did he do it? Well, he decided he couldn't be done with the geometric axioms of Euclid. This makes sense because no one had until that point put forward a clear definition of the length of a curve. Archimedes was left to propose his own definition, but instead, instead of giving a definition, he proposed additional axioms setting forward the properties he thought any reasonable notion of length had to have. The first axiom of Archimedes is that of all curves between two points, 
the straight line has the smallest length. It's certainly plausible, and Archimedes knew that this statement could be proved for all curves made up of straight lines or polygonal paths, but the point was to insist that this hold for all curves. If we accept this axiom, then one of the inequalities is immediate, namely, the circumference of a circle must be greater than the perimeter of an inscribed polygon, since the chord making up any side of the polygon which is straight is necessarily shorter than the arc that it subtends. This immediately gives that sine x is less than x, and implies the continuity, in fact, Lipschitz continuity, of sine and cosine. But the other inequality is more subtle. You can't use the straight line shortest path axiom to conclude that the circumference of a circle is smaller than the perimeter of a circumscribed polygon. Here we're trying to bound the curve length from above by straight segments. Why is the curve ADB shorter than the lengths of the two lines? It must have something to do with the fact that the outer triangle ABC is bigger somehow. Indeed, ABC contains the region bounded by ADB. But it's not the case that every curve entirely contained in the interior of another curve has a shorter length. It certainly won't be true if the interior curve wiggles a lot. Archimedes hit upon a criterion for curves that disallowed the wiggling, convexity. I'm going to use a more modern definition of convexity for convenience that refers to the region enclosed by a curve rather than the curve itself, namely that a region is convex if, given any two points in the region, P and Q, the line segment joining them is entirely contained within the region. Archimedes' second axiom can then be stated if a convex region K is contained in another bounded region R, then the perimeter of K is smaller than the perimeter of R. This will hold even if R is not convex. The region inside a circle is certainly convex, so according to this axiom, its circumference will be smaller than the perimeter of any circumscribed polygon. Here's a diagram that shows how we can derive from this result that for small positive angles x, x is less than tangent of x, since the sector OBE is convex and contained in the quadrilateral OBDE. Part 3. If we're satisfied with the Archimedean axioms, then we're done, but I suspect most people today will not be satisfied. It seems like we should actually prove these axioms of Archimedes. This can be done by making a conceptual leap the Greeks never took, positing a definition of the length of a curve based on parameterizations and limits. It should be noted that if we restrict to polygons, both axioms are not hard to prove. For the first statement, that the straight line gives the shortest distance along any polygonal curve between the points, the proof is a simple induction. The base case, comparing a line to two lines, is just a triangle inequality. If true for any polygonal path of n segments, then by the triangle inequality again, the length of an n plus 1 segment chain is longer than an n segment 1, which is already longer than the straight line. The second axiom is a bit trickier, but this diagram illustrates a proof. Extend from each side of a convex polygon lines at the vertices perpendicular to each side until they hit the boundary of the outer region. Now connect these points on the outer region to form a larger polygon. The larger polygon has perimeter smaller than that of the outer region, but larger than the inner one. The segments corresponding to the sides of the inner polygon are at least as long. They're the hypotenuses of a triangle with base a segment of the same length as the original side, extended in parallel to the first intersection with the outer boundary. Plus there's the extra length at the corners. What makes this diagram work is that the convexity of the inner polygon assures there's no overlap in the regions formed by extending the perpendiculars to the outer boundary. If that happened, it would mean that two different exterior normal vectors to the polygon intersected somewhere. But two outer normals to a convex region can never meet. Say P is a point on the boundary of a convex set, and PA is normal to the set at P, and Q is another point on the boundary with QA exterior normal to K at Q. APQ forms a triangle, so at least one of the angles APQ and AQP must be acute. And since K is convex, the line from P to Q must be in K. 
But then there are points in k to either side of one of its tangent lines, and this can't happen by the convexity of k. I'll leave this last statement about convex sets lying to one side of their tangent lines as an exercise. I'd love to see a proof in the comments. The way we extend the notion of length to curve lines today is to look at all the ways to select points along the curve, connect them with segments, sum the lengths of those segments, and take the limit of such sums as the largest segment goes to zero. If this limit exists, we declare it to be the length of the curve. This involves two moves the Greeks didn't make. First, to make sure the points are taken in the right order, you actually need the curve to be the image of a one-to-one -one continuous function from an interval into the plane and a partition of the interval to give the points. And second, you need to consider limits in the abstract without a procedure for determining whether they exist. Today, with this definition, we would say that the proofs of these axioms for polygons shows that for a curve that bounds a convex region, segments connecting points is the same as and inscribed convex polygons whose perimeters only increase upon addition of points, so the limit is the same as the least upper bound. Because all of these perimeters are bounded by any single perimeter of a polygon that bounds the convex region, we can appeal to the key property of real numbers that a non-empty set which is bounded above has a least upper bound. This is usually discussed in a real analysis course. To conclude that the convex curve has a well-defined length and since the bound holds for all inscribed perimeters, it holds for the limit as well, establishing the second axiom for arbitrary convex curves. The main point is the role of convexity in establishing that arcs of circles have well-defined lengths, and the lengths are bounded by corresponding segments of circumscribed polygons, so that we could prove that x is less than tangent of x for small arcs. I've never seen this point emphasized in any calculus textbook or lecture, though to the credit of James Stewart, author of the most popular college calculus textbook, he does provide in an appendix a geometric proof that x is less than tangent of x. His proof is essentially similar to the proof I've presented of Archimedes' axiom of convexity, just using a normal projection of the circle, which is a radial projection, instead of the normal projection of segments. He divides the arc of length x into n pieces, connecting with inscribed segments, and projects radial lines out through these points to the vertical tangent. The convexity of the circle is what tells us that the angle OQP is acute, since OQ is normal to the circle at Q. Then angle RTS is greater than 90 degrees, and some elementary geometry gives PQ is less than RT is less than RS, the corresponding segment of the tangent of X. Summing all such segments together and taking the limit gives x is less than or equal to the tangent of x, which gives us what we need to calculate the limit sine x over x as x goes to zero. Archimedes never gave a limit definition of arc length or appealed to the least upper bound property, but he did manage to show there was a quantity that represented the circumference of a circle, and he showed how this quantity was related to the area of a circle. Everyone's heard that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and the area is pi r squared, but very few know a rigorous proof. I think in the next episode, I'll go through his argument to give a proper proof that the area of a circle is one half c r. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any more tricky parts of calculus, and check out the rest of my channel where I have uh, like a podcast with great discussions about math and other topics.